On April the 22nd, 1993, 18-year-old Stephen Lawrence was murdered in an unprovoked, racially motivated attack while waiting for a bus. Yeah, his brother's murder cast a dark shadow over Stuart's life. Uh, the revelations and mistakes in the investigation are still servicing 30 years on. Stuart's exploring what it's like to grow up uh, as a black person in Britain in his new book. So, what does it mean to be black and British in 2023? Well, Stuart joins us today. Good Lovely morning, to Stuart. see you. Good to see you. And, uh, good morning. This morning. is the book. It is. We were all very proud of it, growing up black in Britain, because obviously I'm black and I live in Britain. <laughs> and you actually, you wrote a list of 30 people yeah. who you wanted to interview. Yeah. And I can't believe it. I was on the list. Yeah, I was say? on the list, but... So how'd you go about with the list? What was, your, what was so, your starting point for the whole book? My starting point really was I, I went to a school uh, in Mansfield and I, and I visited a, a school there and a young child who'd been in the country three years from Ghana and so her first year she lived in Croydon, loved it, got on with everything, mm -hmm. found life quite easy and then she got moved to Mansfield where she was one of two black girls in her whole year group. Yeah. And that sort of change in her mindset was just really hard for her to get her head around. And sure. I then sort of realised that London's quite a centric idea of multiculturalism, how we all get on. Yeah. And as you go out through the country, it can get a bit sparse in different places. So I just thought it was really important to try and highlight that these issues that do go on for our young people. And the experiences that different people have would, yeah. be, would be very different, um, would be very different uh, depending on the individual. I mean, Lolly Edophobia is really interesting. Yeah. I found that because, you know, I've, I, I know her <laughs> and I met her a few times. She's a brilliant actor. Yeah. I had no idea that wasn't her name. Yeah, yeah. And, that's, and that, again, it's those, those interesting little stories of nuance that happen. So at age four, her best friend couldn't pronounce her proper name fully and just shortened it to Lolly. Yeah. Her mum quite liked it as well. Yeah. It just became one of those things that the whole family just got behind. And now she's an international actress and... Everyone just thinks her name's Lolly, but it's not really, is it? That's but amazing. It is, but it's those little hidden stories that sometimes we just need to take some bit of time and listen and ask people about for them to really unveil their true identity of and themselves. And they're all such different stories. Yeah. There's no two stories no. the same. No. Uh, let's go back to, to your story yeah. and life before Stephen yeah. passed and was murdered. And tell us, what was your life like as a youngster? Yeah, I had a great childhood. I loved it. I lived in an, a, a, a state. Uh, there were lots of our young families on there. Some were holidays, holidays. We, they'd be common that we'd go and play in and ride our bikes and get lost in football. It was an amazing childhood. I really enjoyed myself. Mm. And that's what's, what was really, really strange and weird because I, I didn't think there was any issues or problems yeah. like that. You was a good person, you did good things. Yeah. Life was okay for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after he was murdered, did your life change massively yeah. with regards to yeah. your colour and how you felt? Yeah, my mindset, because that road where Stephen was murdered, I walked up and down that road loads of times. Yeah. There was a cinema down the bottom of the road. Which you see, this, like, it's such a normal looking street. That's yeah. the thing, don't yeah. you? And it, like, I have 100 metres was one of my best friends. So as a teenager, I used to go around here Friday nights, Saturday nights, little parties, little raves, little things. Yeah. Did that all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So to know that that road, yeah. that I'd gone up there and it could have happened to me, was just well, mind-boggling. Did, did you think about that from the start? Or was it, did it take a while for that? I mean, you never, grief never really leaves you. But when, after that initial fog of grief, which, you know, obviously... Did, Create, uh, you know, has different people in different ways, yeah. you know? And especially when, you've, when your brother's been through what he's been through and what your family's been through what he's been through. But when did you start to analyse what it was like to be a young a black man in Britain? I suppose as soon as I... Was, again, sort of 16, and I started driving, so not too long after that, and then I got stopped a couple of times after that, and then you sort of realise, you speak to other people, like some of my friends, do you been stopped? Like, no. Mm. And you sort of go, well, hold on, mm. is it just because I'm black mm -hmm. I've been stopped? Mm -hmm. And you start to realise, and he hears other people's stories and antidotes, then you start to realise, yeah, hold on a minute, it is just because I'm and black. And you don't want to think that at no. all, oh, do you? Because you don't no, want to be no, a victim exactly, in, in exactly. anything. Exactly, I'm, I'm not... And you don't want to no. think that, but yeah. when you realise, yeah. he's literally, yeah. because of yeah. the colour of my skin... Yeah, 100%. I don't have a victim and, um, outlook to life No, at all. I can see that. When you read the book, you do get that. That, for me, is a little bit defeatist that's a little bit you, you put yourself behind things and sure. away from things straight away whereas if I'm open and going you know what? everyone's just gonna be nice yeah and then I take deal with people on a case-by-case -case basis I try to as much as I can to have that outlook because as soon as you start to feel things and start to see things you, yeah. you don't go well what else could it be because there's that you know incredible story of your, you and your son and your son and you get pulled over yeah and your son's like, hang on a minute, I make, like, Lego figurines out of these guys. <laughs> yeah. These are the good guys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Why are the good guys pulling us over? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's the thing about it as well, and I, I tell people, to, I, I don't want to give my son that complex of all the police are bad, you know, they're going to... 
He loved his Lego City blocks. He made a brilliant little stop animation film of, you know, the cops chasing the robbers and yeah. whatever. Yeah. So his concept is, if you're a bad person, if you do something wrong, sure. the police are going to get you. It? If you're yeah. a good person, you're fine. Yeah. And what do you make about the whole situation with regards to institutional racism? Because obviously there was the Sewell report yeah. that was out in 2021 and that concluded that there was no institutional yeah. racism. However, you've got the McPherson yep. report which concluded there was institutional racism yeah. when it came to finding the, the killers and yep. bringing that to justice. Yeah. But we've also just had Casey review as well recently, yeah. and she's also backed up more what McPherson said than Sulroof said. So it's almost like a counter sort of part yeah, it, all the it, time. It, and it was, a, I just felt at that time, the country was trying to say after George Floyd that we're not racist, we've, we're fine, we've moved things forward, you know, we've made so much progression. And, and we have, we've moved things yeah. forward a little bit. We have made some progress, but there's still little areas and institutions where we can do better, I do believe. But if we say there is no racism, where do we actually go from there? Where's the education? We yeah. can't actually move forward, yeah. can we? No, definitely not. Yeah. Absolutely what would, you, what would be your big brush strokes, do you think, if you could sit down with, you know, people in the Met? What, you know, where does it start? I, I believe, and I'm um, sorry, what, Clive Driscoll, like, he, he's an amazing police officer and, when I speak to him, because I, I speak to him sometimes before I go and speak to other police officers, and he says to me, Stuart, all you need to tell him is to do the basics. Give us a backdrop on Clive Driscoll. So Clive Driscoll was the officer who yeah. found the conviction evidence yeah. that, that convicted the two boys that yes. got um, in the case of my brother. And yeah. like I said, he always says, if you just ask them to do their basic job really well and ask every officer to imagine when they come in contact with someone that could be a member of their family, mm -hmm. and how would you like your own member of a family to be treated? Surely with dignity, with respect. Yeah. yeah. And when you have that aspect of when you look at life, you can go, well, surely everyone will be treated nicely then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell me something. How would you encourage people to make a change? What can we all do in order to make a difference in life? Well, reading the books like that was a brilliant idea as well. Understanding. I always say to people as well, lots of people think there's difference because my skin colour's different from your skin colour. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So therefore we must be different. Yeah. We both support Arsenal, yes. we both love football. Yeah. There's lots of more things we have in common if we decide to sit down and have conversations and yeah. find out things about people. For, it's just not being scared of the other, whatever yeah, the other exactly. is. Yeah. Exactly. It's Embrace about it. finding commonality because yeah, it's yeah. always there. Because that's the thing, like, this needs to go to a wider audience. Yeah. This can't just be read by young black men. No. Because, it's, because it's if that's be the case, everybody. you're just preaching to the choir, exactly. right? It's exactly. got to be people whose experience isn't this yeah. so exactly. people learn about yeah. it. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what I said to someone last night on social media. So I said, oh, has book sales... I was going, well, have you bought the book? And they were like, mm, not quite yet. And I was like, well, not doing so well then, is it? Because I need every everyone to get back. It's not just for, like you said, for black children, or children of colour, of culture. It's for everyone to understand. Like I said, we have more things in common than we have in difference. Yeah. Lovely talking to you. I like all your inspirations as well. I think you've got Nelson Mandela, Stormzy. Yeah. They're all different generations. Yeah. You've got uh, Greta Thunberg. Yeah. I, mean... I like to say to young people as well, everyone goes, oh, but you've got to be old to, to start and make action. No, Greta started when she was 16. Mm. Yeah. One person by herself. Got her mate involved. Encouraged others. Infused yeah. others. That's what we all can do to get behind things. And that's Thanks. what you're doing now. Well, great. Well, let's, give, let's give it the shot. There it is, Thanks. growing up black in Britain. And I'm in it. Yeah. I've got a little chapter as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.